So last not least, in our video series about scientific work, let's speak about the text itself, about the text, the thesis, or the paper, or the homework, whatever you want to call that. Um, how do you do that? What's important when uh, you speak about or when we think about uh, writing a text? Again, the limitation. A lot of those things I will tell you here belong to a certain area of scientific work along a certain research community or are preferences that I have. So speak with your supervisor regarding concrete details like, again, templates, for example, or the style they want to have for uh, when you do uh, literature references. So uh, the question here is, how do you structure a text? Where would you begin? Uh, and uh, of course, it's a difficult thing. You have a lot of things you want to put into the text. Uh, where do you put them? Is there a certain structure you could follow? And you have already seen that. I've shown it to you very briefly. They show you uh, one I uh, oriented myself towards. Uh, this is one uh, that uh, I obtained uh, from the uh, Bodden uh, Research Group. And they uh, gave their students this uh, list here, this structure, starting with an abstract, an introduction, problem statement, then background information, an approach, implementation, evaluation, then threats to validity, so uh, validity, then, th then threats to validity, why might this not be valid, what you do, limitations, future work, related work, and the conclusion. Uh, this is very much a standard um, approach. It's very structured, standard scientific, but a little tailored towards software engineering. So everywhere you will get have similar outlines, which are always a little different. And I created mine, my own, for my seminars, and uh, they are uh, like this. This would be my adaption. An abstract, I don't think we need. An abstract is a very short summary at the beginning. Um, that's uh, something which is important in uh, research papers because uh, conferences are organized that way. You get a program where all the abstracts are in. And it's also important for a doctoral thesis, things like that. I think for a seminar work, we don't need it. But what we need is a good introduction. And we'll speak about the introduction in a moment. Then we need a description of the problem, including the background, and that can include the related work already. So that would be explaining the state of the art and explaining the problem with the state of the art. Then you have the approach. You tell uh, us what you want uh, to do and how you do that. And then we don't have an implementation in most of my seminars, but it's rather an argumentation you have. You have a lot of uh, uh, evidence from literature and you bring it together in certain ways. You could, of course, here also describe what you did, that you did a, um, a survey, that you did an interview, uh, that you did some measurements. All those things would here go in between, but uh, in this case would be uh, an argumentation. Maybe you, we evaluate that, so that would then uh, follow. Then we speak about limitations. So what did we uh, leave out? Why, what limits what we have done here? Where did we do shortcuts? Uh, things like that. Which important aspects did we not consider? That leads to future work so we can suggest that things should be done in the future, and a conclusion so that is like wrapping it up. These last two, for example, the conclusion and future work, typically go together. In many um, texts, you have conclusion and future work, and that is in a good way of doing it, because the conclusion looks back, and the future work looks forward. And we could very well put that together and start with the conclusion, and then uh, end with the future work. So uh, this is only a rule of thumb. You don't have to do it exactly that way. And what is important to know is, one, these are not headings. So that does not necessarily have to be an introduction called introduction, even though introduction is often called an introduction. But there should not be um, um, a heading or a chapter which is called argumentation. Call the chapters regarding to what you do. So uh, if you need a chapter about 
the properties of a certain programming language, call it exactly that way and call it the properties of C++, things like that. Don't call it approach, argumentation, evaluation. Uh, that's not necessary here. I know that there are research areas where that is the case, where uh, papers are often or almost all the time follow the same structure with the same word for certain sections. If that is the case, your supervisor should be able to tell you about it. More important than this outline is that you have a consistent plot, uh, that there is a focus in there, that you know what you want to say and tell it from the beginning where that would, where you want it to go. And then you have a consistent plot, a consistent thread which uh, leads us there. That is way more important than uh, the question whether the limitations uh, belong here or should be rather at the beginning, whether related work is something which you have at the beginning or at the end. All of this uh, you will find. Uh, that doesn't matter. The order of things is not important. It depends on how you can make it a sensible way of telling something. Of course, the introduction comes first and the end is the end. But in between, many, many things are possible. Well, the introduction. The introduction is something which often gets way too little attention. And uh, that leads to texts uh, of which, when you read them, you don't know why you would even bother reading them. What is it about? Why are you all doing it? And um, that's really important. Uh, it is really important to make the reader understand what it all is about and where it leads to. So the introduction should answer three very basic questions. And those are the questions, why is the topic interesting? Why would you even look into it? What exactly do you want to do in your work? What's the purpose of it and what's the content of it? And how do you want to achieve that? So these three questions are the basic questions which should be answered in uh, the introduction of your thesis and also, by the way, in the introduction of your presentation. So these three questions are very helpful. Being so helpful, they are also those three questions which guide me when I um, supervise bachelor or master theses. Uh, when you're doing your bachelor or master thesis uh, at the University of Paderborn, at least, and the computer science department, you have to create a proposal. So we have one month of time in which we two, so you as the student who wants to do it and me as the supervisor, we come together and we figure out a topic. So it's not that I necessarily have a topic and you just do it or you come into the office and have a topic and just take it. Uh, but uh, it's often a process. So it's always a process. And in this one month, you create a proposal. And in the proposal, you tell me uh, and we'll together figure out why you want to do it, what you want to do it and how you do it. And so this proposal is more or less what will later be the introduction um, of something. So this is very helpful. Uh, of course, you don't write the introduction first. Typically, you write the introduction last because only in the end you really know what you have done. So then, only then, you can write the introduction for it. But then it should all be oriented towards these three questions. By the way, in the introduction, you can already tell us about the results. This is not a crime novel. We don't have to figure out who the murderer is and it must only be um, uh, known on the last page of the novel. You can tell us everything at the beginning. You don't necessarily have to, but at least you should tell us where this goes to. So you're writing your text and within your text you are heavily relying on text you have read, on a literature you have obtained before, on sources you want to use. We have spoken about that in the first video and you have seen how important that is. I, I hope I have made that clear how important it is to do good literature research. So how do you reference those things? When do you have to reference those things? Uh, so a reference to a source. 
uh, sometimes called a citation, which is a little misleading. Uh, that's why I only put it in brackets. So if you quote someone, if it's really a citation, you are using someone else's words. Someone has provided you with uh, uh, an explanational text you want to copy into your own text because uh, it is so good or it is because that is the text you want to refer to later and you want to speak about concretely. Then you do a quotation. That means you put something in quotation marks when you do it in the line of the text or you create a block reference which means you put it into a paragraph of its own which is indented and often in italics. Uh, then you can use citation marks but necessarily have to. In that case, of course, you have to tell us where you have that from, so you make a reference. Almost everyone knows that. If you do that wrong, it is definitely plagiarism. So you are using other people's words uh, and thereby copying other people's work. And if you don't uh, make it clear that that is a quotation, um, a citation, uh, then it is plagiarism. And plagiarism is something which will be punished. But it's also not correct, uh, also using other people's work, claiming it would be your own, when you're not quoting it, but when you're just using it. And um, in computer science, quotations are not really common. You don't often cite someone else's work word by word. It's way more common in other um, sciences. Uh, but often you rely on other people's findings, you rely on other people's ideas, you rely on other people's theories, which you base your uh, research on. And all of that needs to be referenced. So as soon as you use someone else's thought, uh, which has been put down somewhere, you need to put in a reference. And that is also true when you translate from another language. So it's not correct just to, to uh, translate something which you found in a Russian paper or in a whatever Chinese paper, Turkish paper, uh, French paper, English paper, German paper, whatever, translate it into your language, your writing, and then claim it to be your own. No, of course not. It's still uh, the property of that person who put it down and you have to reference those things. So we have to do references kind of all the time. References are the foundation of everything. So the literature is the foundation, but to show that this is the foundation, we put in references. And now something uh, which I have to preach <laughs> to some degree. References are good including references is a good thing. Some people think, and I think it's something that comes from your school days, sometimes people think that uh, copying something from somewhere else or using someone else's idea uh, is punished. Uh, and uh, of course in school days often punished and if you do uh, uh, exercises here for computing or whatever and use someone else's uh, um, uh, uh, results. Uh, that's also something that is punished where as soon as we realize that is happening. Uh, but here we are in a different field. We are using someone else's work to build upon it. And also already the collection of someone else's work of many many people's work and relating it to each other. That is also something that you then do. So building the reference is very important. It does not show a lack of your own ideas. It shows that you know what you are talking about and it puts your own work into a perspective. It puts you into relation to the scientific world. Uh, if you had a text without any quotations, no, without any uh, references, and it would be correct without any references, uh, then you, it couldn't be scientific work because it would be kind of isolated in the void. That cannot be so. So creating references is a very, very good thing. 
When you are not including references where they are needed, that is called plagiarism and plagiarism is something that we will punish. The university has software which use, it uses to test for plagiarism. Uh, so we put uh, texts into that software and they tell us whether you have copied that from somewhere else. But we also use our own heads to figure out whether something is plagiarism and we often find it. Of course, uh, if someone plagiarizes very well, I don't know. <laughs> uh, so I, uh, the, the claim which I would make that I find all plagiarism, uh, um, I cannot maintain because that one I haven't found, I don't know about. But I, I think I, f I find a lot. Uh, and uh, others are good at that as well. So uh, figuring that out, we have our noses uh, for that. Uh, the university punishes that. You can even be expelled from university if you plagiarize. It won't happen in a seminar, it won't happen in a pro-seminar. You get a bad grade and you uh, will be called uh, to the uh, examination officer about that, but there will, no be, uh, will not be any expelling. But if you do it in your bachelor degree, in your master thesis or in your doctoral thesis, uh, the results uh, can be w really bad, as you can see in the following video. The defense minister is used to the limelight, and usually he enjoys the attention. But this time it was a different matter. Karl Theodor zu Gutenberg had to face sharp opposition questioning in the Bundestag about his doctoral thesis. He admitted making some mistakes. The minister was in Afghanistan when the scandal first broke over a week ago. He was accused of having copied parts of his doctoral thesis submitted five years ago. Suddenly, it was the hot topic in the media. And an internet site was set up to comb through the minister's doctoral thesis for evidence of errors and plagiarism. On his return to Germany, the minister gave a short statement on the matter to a hand-picked selection of journalists. The dissertation that I wrote is not a work of plagiarism, and I most firmly reject the allegation. Since then, more and more passages have been found that were clearly not written by the minister himself. It is indeed from an article that I wrote in the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. I'm not cited as the author. That's a clear breach of academic rules. Germany's defense minister has resigned over accusations that he copied parts of his university dissertation for his doctorate. Zu Guttenberg, until now seen by some as a future possible leader, was viewed as the most popular of Chancellor Angela Merkel's cabinet, and his loss is a blow to her ruling Christian Democrat Party. So you've seen that plagiarism is not something you should laugh about. It is a dangerous matter and a serious matter, so we have to avoid that. And avoiding that means including the references wherever they are needed, and they are needed as soon as you have some information from somewhere else. Well, there is of course always the question, how far do I have to get? Like if I cover some kind of technology and that technology uh, in some part uses uh, the rendering of HTML, do I have to make a reference to the World Wide Web Consortium? No, you don't. Uh, there is something which is common knowledge and which is also common knowledge among um, your fellow researchers. So if you say something that every student, every bachelor student, every master student knows, then you don't need a reference. But if it is a core part of your thesis, you would put in a reference anyway because you have to build upon it. And if it uh, is something that not everybody knows, which is very specialized uh, knowledge, then you need a reference. We can speak about that. Ask me uh, when that question arises. Um, I will tell you whether you need a reference or you don't need one. But rather have one reference too much than uh, uh, one uh, too little. So if there's a missing reference, uh, that can uh, put you into trouble, as uh, at least if it's very central, um, then you will get into trouble uh, with that. So, uh, as I said, citations are not uh, really done very often. 
uh, and they are often more done in other subjects. But how do you do that if you are in the situation uh, to have to do it? Uh, let's look at this example. Uh, these Automatic digital computing systems. I put that into quotation marks here because those words are not words I came up with, but which uh, uh, come from John von Neumann. He called a computer an automatic digital computing system. That's why I put it in quotation marks. The reference is right behind it, are described by von Neumann. Uh, and I put it uh, uh, here because it's also the reference for the next paragraph, which is a block quote. So it's a quotation which is a little longer, and that's why I indented it, and I put it into uh, quotation marks. That's a matter of style, you could do it without that. Um, then I would do, put it in italics, I think. Uh, but you see that it is a quotation, and he called it a usually highly composite device, etc., etc. What you see at the beginning, is a sign which uh, means there are some words which I left out. So it didn't start with A usually. There was text before that. The, te the sentence did not start there. Uh, so that's uh, this brackets with two dots in there. And you can also use the same thing uh, if you need, for some reason, need to uh, change the uh, grammar. A uh, typical example is um, that somewhere in the text which you cite, uh, there is uh, an it in there, for example, or a him or her. Let's, let's speak about the it. This it refers to some word which has been used before, some concept, some terminology. And uh, when we are citing it, uh, this we'll have to fill in what the it stood for. So then we'll put the, uh, the, these brackets in there and put the word in there. Uh, we can also use it to change the grammar to fit more into our sentence. So that's all okay. We can use these things for, for that. We must never change the meaning of the text, of course, by um, using those brackets. Um, that's not allowed. So that would be a miscitation, wrong citation, like the one I mentioned in the first video where I told you to look into the original sources. That was a uh, wrong citation, wrong citation style. Then there is uh, uh, this sick in uh, in these brackets with the exclamation mark in there. I don't have in mind what it exactly stands for. It's uh, an abbreviation in Latin. Uh, it means uh, like this and exactly like this. Uh, and you put it behind something uh, when you do a citation, but there is an error within the citation. You cite the error, you copy the error, and you put this sick behind it to indicate that it's not you who made the error, but the error has been in the original. Uh, so, like here, a compter is a digital device. If you found that somewhere and someone uh, uh, wrote computer wrongly, uh, you copy that and uh, put it into compter. Okay. Please, there is a tendency of using sick for something else. Please don't use sick if you are not happy with what you cite. Uh, use it only if it is wrong and factually wrong or uh, grammatically wrong or a spelling mistake, something like that. Uh, like here, like uh, from Star Trek, that's from the intro of Star Trek, where no man has gone before. And if you would put the sick there, you could indicate, or some people would do that to indicate, that one should not say so, uh, because it's, of course, not only man, uh, uh, but it's also uh, women who have never gone there before. So nowadays they say where no one has gone before. But it, that's not wrong. It has been put that way. It's grammatically correct. Uh, it, ha it was the way of speaking. So don't do that, please. Uh, don't uh, try to make a comment on uh, uh, what is there uh, by putting in sick. Uh, use it only when there is really a grammatically or a linguistic uh, error there or when, there, when a factual uh, thing is wrong, like a uh, a wrong reference in time or something like that. Then you would put sick. So, uh, not only in 
uh, citations, you have to include references. You also include references when you are referring to something which you uh, then go on using. Like here, I have uh, included a number of styles here. There are many, many different styles uh, which you use to make the reference. Uh, look, let's look at this. Uh, the text is always the same, of course. The concept of technical potentials of digital media has been proposed in one. That is something you find often in ACM papers and in uh, other um, organizations who use this uh, style with the numbers. I don't like it. I, let me just tell you, I don't like that because when you have that, you're always flipping the pages because you always have to look up what that meant, what that who that was, and uh, even I can't remember. So uh, who was seventeen again? And then I'm flipping the pages again. Um, <clears throat> uh, if you want to do me a favor, don't use it in your seminar. Uh, the second one, for example, has been proposed by Vin Seventeen. So here we have an abbreviation, which is part of the author's name. Uh, and uh, the 17 would refer to the year. And uh, that is something uh, which is closer to it. I see from when it is. I can um, maybe remember uh, what the, who that was. Um, yeah, I prefer that. Then there is this one uh, where you put everything in brackets, like Winkler Kemper 2017. Uh, I like that very much. I use that style in my doctoral thesis. Uh, it is, uh, I like it because you can read it and you can include it into the text easily. And uh, the number four is uh, kind of identical, only that the brackets are only behind the 2017. Uh, I would now use that actually, because it's uh, uh, orthographically more sound to put it that way. Uh, the brackets are in the top uh, are kind of a little distracting. I would that, use that one if I put uh, if I'd put the uh, reference behind something. So I would say uh, technical potentials have been uh, around since uh, the 1980s, whatever. And then uh, I uh, put in the citation or the reference behind that and uh, say uh, brackets. Winkelkemper 2017 brackets. Uh, that uh, would be the style. So those two can uh, can be mixed, and it's easy to mix them even in uh, LaTeX, like, uh, for example, um, where you can use both. Then one would be Cite. That would be the the number four that would produce that. And if you use Cite P, which you can use to specify uh, pages too, uh, then the the one at the top uh, appears. Uh, conferences often provide you with a style guideline or a template and they often tell you which citation style you have to use. Uh, if that is the case and if someone forces you to uh, use a certain style, use it. Uh, there's no need to debate those things. Uh, if you have the opportunity to choose, I would be glad if you chose number three or number four. There are, of course, others uh, available. And I know that in other subjects, like in history, for example, citations are often made in footnotes. We don't do that in computer science. Uh, footnotes are only used for remarks we make about something, but they are not used uh, for literature references. Um, okay, if the text is longer, you have to specify where you find it in the text. You have to either specify a page, a chapter, or a section. If you don't do that, uh, it is, the reference is not helpful. Like uh, saying it is in the Bible, or it is in this big book of 500 pages. Should I read it all? No, you have to specify where it is in there. And then there is uh, the, uh, the issue of more than one author. Uh, look at this, Winkelkemper 2019, only one author and the, uh, the year. Then we have two authors, Winkelkemper and Selke 2017. No problem, we put an end between it. And then there would be uh, the case where there are several authors, maybe at least three, that may be 20. Uh, then only the first author is mentioned and it says et al. Be behind that and a year. So that would be the, the three possibilities in this citation style. So now we have made the references and 
where are the where is the information behind the references it is in a in a, a section at the end which is often called literature and the literature section can look like this this is part of the literature section of my doctoral thesis and you see there I repeated the style it was named uh, at the beginning so there's this style again Agravala 2006 Apple 1983 etc and I provided information about uh, the literature and I was extensive and that is important you have to be extensive in the information you specify the author the title of the text the book the publisher the year the pages or you provide equivalence sometimes the author cannot be determined like in the second example where I only put Apple I don't know who the author was it's not specified so I tell I say the author is Apple the organization becomes the author sometimes uh, what you have is not written text what do we do then uh, what do we do when we have web content? We have something on the web we want to refer to. Uh, but of course, there is not really the publisher. There's not a book. Uh, what do we do? Well, let me give you an example. I want to refer to a certain page about functions on the PHP website, the PHP programming language, that is. It is a valid source. Of course, I can use it in certain contexts. Uh, so, what do I put as the title? I put in the title of the page, that would be function definition, something like that. Then, instead of the magazine or the book, the book title where it appeared in, I would say that is now the uh, PHP manual, the PHP reference manual. I have to look it up how exactly it is called. The author, can I determine the author? Most likely I cannot, so it would be php.net itself, so the organization it would be. So now I have the year. What year can I use? Um, sometimes it is possible to figure out what the year is when the text was created on websites. Uh, sometimes you have a version history and you could back, go back into the version history until the information uh, you want to refer to appears and then you have the year which you could put in there. Uh, that is also possible in Wikipedia. In Wikipedia you have the version history, you can look into older versions or you can just say I'll refer to the current version and if you want to do that you put in the, the, the year of now, it would be 2023 now or whatever the year is you're watching this in and um, you would could then create a URL uh, which always refers to this version. So uh, uh, Wikipedia has the ability to uh, create links to old versions of uh, texts and that you can, that's something you can use. Uh, that can also be done for any kind of website, like the PHP example I had, the Wayback Machine, that's archive.org, the Internet Archive, that you can use to look at older versions of a website or of non-existing web, non-existing websites for that matter, and I put in the URL here, and you see that it was first visited by the Wayback Machine way back in the year 2009. So okay, I could look at that version and could maybe put 2009 in there if that is the version, uh, uh, if that version already uh, included what I want to refer to. It's not quite likely. Uh, I would have to look for a for a version which would be the first version which includes what I want uh, in there. Or I could use just uh, the present day uh, if I want to refer to the current version of it. Uh, and then I could use the URL which is created there because those URLs are permanent URLs, they don't change. And even if something is not, um, not yet in the index uh, of the Wayback Machine, I can make them index that and then have a URL which I can use. Providing such URLs is helpful because they don't change. You know this 404 problem and a typical way of, um, well, not circumventing it, of coping with it is uh, to put an uh, information in there when you accessed it. But um, it's not really helpful actually um, that um, then I know that <laughs> someone claims that at a certain point in time um, it had this piece of information uh, why not provide a URL which has it all the time? 
So I would encourage you to use uh, such URLs um, and uh, then provide the version you have. Uh, what do you do if it is a YouTube video? Uh, do you have title magazine author year URL then? Yes, we have. The YouTube video has a title. It appears on a certain channel. The channel would be the magazine. Then there is an author or it would be the channel name again. It has been published at a certain point in time. That would be the year. And of course, you can provide a URL. So for almost every kind of source, you can provide similar information to uh, the um, the ones that were specified here, like title, magazine, author, year, URL. Uh, and it is important, I consider it very important, that you give me all the information. Never have something in there which is only a title and a URL. I don't accept that. That's not a valid uh, literature reference. You have to provide more information. And it is important to have those because that helps me as a reader and as your supervisor to understand what kind of uh, source that is. Is it a book? Is it a public magazine? Is it a YouTube video by a trusted source? Or is it something else? I can see that if I have the information. Otherwise, I would have to try to figure it all out. And that takes very long and I don't want to do it. And it's not good scientific style either. So all this information has to be provided. What about tables and figures? Uh, often you have tables. Often you create the tables with data you created yourself. Then, of course, you don't have to provide any reference. You can also, of course, provide uh, uh, figures of your own, uh, graphics of your own, images of your own. Uh, you don't need references if you do that yourself. If you take them from somewhere else, you need a reference. We need a reference in there. And you see here, like this uh, image, I did not create myself. I taken it from somewhere else. And it says so in the description of the image. So this is figure 13. It has a description. And uh, it says what it is and said mind map and description taken from Busan and Busan 2003 and then where I got it from. So if you use images, graphics, uh, tables, whatever source from somewhere else, you need to make a reference, not only for text, also for images. Images and tables always need a description. They need a number and a description. The description must describe what is be what is seen on there. Uh, and then when there is a description, or rather when there is a number, like here it's figure 13, this figure 13 needs to be referenced in the text. So there is never a, gra uh, a piece of graphics, an image, a table, which is not referenced in the text. If it's not referenced, you don't need it. In the text you say that you see something in a certain figure, that a table uh, makes something clear, that uh, the image uh, shows something. So always reference the material you put into the text. Always reference images, graphics and tables. So last not least, let's speak about language for a moment. Uh, of course, you have to use good scientific English, which means there's correct spelling and there's correct grammar. That's a prerequisite for everything. Uh, and of course, uh, I know that most of you, uh, for, or at least for many of you, uh, English is not your first language, and neither is it for me. So um, uh, I won't be too strict with it, but please try to, try, uh, to have a correct spelling, correct grammar. There are aids for that, either technologically or you can have people read it and uh, they can, of course, correct those things. But the question rather is, what makes it scientific? What makes the style scientific? And again, unfortunately, it's a matter of routine. It's not easy to tell. Uh, I cannot uh, tell you exactly what makes a style a scientific style. There are some things you should avoid, uh, and that's typically magazine style, uh, like this one here. In today's society, surviving without a smartphone is virtually unthinkable. Well, 
uh, first of all, the what does this uh, sentence say? Nothing. It's no, no. There's no information given, and it's plainly wrong. Of course, you can think that. You can think about surviving without a smartphone. That's typical magazine style or maybe YouTube video style. It's not really scientific style. Don't do that. Uh, try to avoid such sentences. You don't use subjective things. You don't say it's a bad system. I don't like it. Uh, don't do that. That's not scientific either. It can never be. It's not about your opinion. Scientific style is always about facts and if you say something is bad you must have some criteria which tell why it is bad and what under what uh, circumstance, under what uh, perspective something is bad. Not I think it's bad. That's not scientific style. In general, and that's a problem I often see, be careful with the usage of the word I and the, words, uh, the word we. There are parts of science where both are not used whatsoever, where it's very bad style. I personally would say you can use I as long as it refers to what you have done and what you will do. So you can say, in chapter 1 I have introduced this and this. In chapter 5 I will uh, speak about Klingon philosophy in more detail. Such things you can do. It avoids sentences like chapter 1 has introduced or this and this has been introduced in chapter 1, which is also perfectly okay. Uh, it's a little more friendly, I would say, if you say I. But never use I uh, in the sense of I think or in my opinion. Uh, that's, that would be wrong. That would not be scientific. Never use we. Never use we. If you are two people writing a text together, then of course you could we in the same sense as I said, you use the I. But if you're writing a text alone, never use we. Never use we. I always get text full of we. I don't know why. It must be taught somewhere. It is bad scientific style to do that. And it is bad style to a greater extent, actually, because it assumes that you and the reader are together and have the same experience. Uh, and what would you indicate there? As we have learned, as we have understood, how do you know what someone has learned? How do you know what someone has understood? Don't do that. Don't assume what the reader has done. That also means you would never say, as you have understood, uh, or as you have learned in the chapter. That's also not good scientific style. You have to stick with, has been explained there, uh, has been pointed out there, as I pointed out, but not as you understood, and not as we understood. Never use you, never use we not in scientific style. Unfortunately, or sometimes it makes texts a little boring and a little stiff, but that's how scientific style works. Now, I have one final aspect I want to speak you, with you about regarding language, and that is some uh, a, 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 um, an aspect uh, which us Germans have way more problems with uh, than the English-speaking community has. And that is what we in Germany call gendering. That's a word that doesn't exist in the English language, even though it is an English word. We, what it means is we use gender-neutral language. I often try to do it, but I'm not perfect in it. Uh, maybe you have realized that sometimes I use a generalized he, where, uh, uh, well, it could, should be he or she, or in the English language, you can use the singular they, like in everyone has to do their homework. Everyone is singular and they is plural, but there is this singular they, uh, which we can use if we want, uh, don't want to specify the gender. And that's easy in English. So the English have, it, uh, have an easy way of doing that. Otherwise, in English, it's often uh, very easy because 
uh, the the professions etc it's all neutral and you uh, the few things where it was not uh, you can make it neutral so nowadays we're not speaking about the headmaster anymore but the head person or uh, it's not the anchor man anymore but it's the anchor uh, it's not policeman policewoman but it's the police uh, in general police person so that is really easily possible Please do that. Please uh, try to be as gender as gender neutral as possible. It has been found out that if you, we are not, if we use uh, male-only forms, that uh, and including, assuming we include everyone, uh, people don't understand everyone. People read that they understand men only, and we don't want that. Of course, what's not our intention. So please try to do gender neutral um, language. And if you are interested in it, ask a German about how it has to be done in German, because we really have a problem with it at the moment. And it's a matter of big, big debate, because people, there are people who don't like uh, the style we use at the moment uh, at all. Okay, thank you very much for this. This has been the last video uh, in the th series about uh, scientific work. Uh, I hope it uh, helps you in your, the creation of your uh, scientific work or in seminars, pro-seminars, in the master thesis, in a bachelor thesis. And if you have questions, please always feel free to ask me about anything regarding those things. And remember, uh, if you are uh, using uh, some of this somewhere else, ask your respective supervisor about their opinion on certain aspects. Thank you very much.